So, so let's talk about Chris Harney and, and, and what happened there. Um, uh, why particularly Chris Harney? I asked you that question earlier, but, but why not Nelson Mandela? Why did you not decide to go for Nelson Mandela or for Thabo Mbeki? Okay. Uh, Chris Harney was a man who, because of his hardline approach, had the support of the radical youth. We wanted South Africa to be delivered into a state where they couldn't govern any longer. And then the security forces would have to declare martial law. They would take over, they would restore law and order, and then elections would have to be uh, arranged. And in that election, according to all of the, uh, the fundis, we would have won the election, we would have become the new government. We would, of course, have continued with the policy of, of several development because it was working, it was successful. Even uh, KwaZulu-Natal under, under Chief Butelezi was governing itself. All of the other states, although they didn't accept uh, independence, they were governing themselves and they were doing it gradually and very effectively. And had that been allowed to continue, we would not have had the chaos that we have today. So, so um, you are a devout Christian and you speak about it quite, op uh, quite openly. How, how do you rationalize the decision that was taken in terms of your, your, your religion? Well, you know, we were in a state of war. Unfortunately, the security forces controlled it so well that the average man in the street had no idea. The only people who were really aware of the fact that we were at war were the, were the relatives and friends of youngsters who were killed on the border, uh, engaged in the war against Swapo and uh, the, the East Germans and the Cubans, uh, and we had, lost, we had lots of casualties. But it was far away. In, in our cities and, and towns, things were peaceful thanks to the government. The control, was the, the, thanks to the uh, security forces, the control was good. So people didn't re realize there was war, but in wartime, anything goes. And I believe that one of the big problems with Chris Harney was that as an ardent uh, communist, he didn't believe in the Almighty God anyway. Uh, and I saw him as being part of the Antichrist. Mm. So if you can maybe take us to the, through the process, what happened uh, or at what stage did you involve Janus Valus? Because you were not the one who pulled the trigger. No. Okay, Janus was an interesting story. Uh, you know that because there was this rift between English and, Afri and Afrikaans speakers, uh, I started, uh, I initiated an organization called the Salad Foundation, which was uh, a vehicle which we could use to get to English speaking people to tell them what our, uh, our political policy was and how the English-speaking community fitted into it. Jonas became interested and he came to a meeting of ours and became quite involved with the Stellar Foundation after that. And he used to come and visit regularly and we used to have political discussions. And when de Klerk closed the democratic route by forbidding or by banning uh, elections at parliamentary or municipal uh, level, it was clear that there was no longer a de democratic process available. And so I, as one of the senior members of the CP, sat back and thought, now how do we stop this? Because this is going to be a takeover of our country which we must prevent. How do we do it? And I came to the conclusion that uh, to take out somebody like uh, Chris Harney, who had a big following amongst the radicals who would certainly have uh, rioted uh, on the occasion of his death, that could render South Africa ungovernable. And that was the, uh, and, and when I discussed this, uh, Volus and I used to have many discussions. And I discussed that with him and he said, well, you know, if we had to do something like that, because I suggested that we take out a high profile figure, he said he would he would be prepared to do the the shooting. Mm. So so was that an instruction that you gave to him, or was it a, a discussion between the two of you that and, and an agreement between the two of you? Well, obviously, I mean, I, I couldn't instruct him to commit murder. He volunteered to do to to do it, but it fitted in with the with the plan, and as far as I was concerned, it was a political objective, 
uh, and I was justified in that I was uh, such a senior member of the Conservative Party in getting him to agree, well, you know, accepting his offer and saying, okay, you want to do it, you do it, but keep me out of it. Um, so, so in how much detail was it discussed? Did you plan on a particular date? Did you plan on, on going to Chris Harney's house? No, or? no. And in fact, I'm, I must say here, and this is something which didn't come out generally, um, he had a, I had a silencer fitted to a weapon which I had because we were collecting weapons in case the clerk cancelled all weapon licenses. So we had to have unregistered unreg uh, weapons. And I obtained this uh, nine mil, and I wanted to fit a, a silencer to it so that I could use it at home without disturbing the neighbors. So I had the silencer fitted and it just happened to coincide with Valusa's request where he said, I need an unlicensed weapon, which I could then give to him. But the weapon with a, a silencer on needs a special type of ammunition. And I undertook to get that in, uh, ammunition for him. I also used it as a way to retain control because at that stage I still wasn't convinced that it was the right thing to do. But unfortunately, I didn't know that uh, Walus had his own 9mm pistol. And he took the one that I provided, he tested it, he found problems with the uh, silencer because the thing had to be cocked every time uh, you wanted to fire a shot. And so he d dispensed with the silencer. He then went and bought ammunition for his 9mm and he used that in the weapon which I provided. So, so you didn't agree on a particular date. How did you, did you hear about it on the news or how did you hear about this? Well, it was quite, uh, we were actually visiting friends who had just moved into Krugersdorf to welcome them. We were having tea and the telephone rang and uh, this friend's wife answered the phone and she came back and she said, oh, Chris harney has been shot. And of course, when I heard it, I had a tremendous feeling of relief because I knew that because I had the ammunition which he needed, he, it couldn't have been Valus who did it. And then I found out on the Sunday that uh, it was actually him, and uh, I can tell you it was quite a shock. So how did you, f did you find out when he was arrested? Yeah. I know he was seen by a witness who went to the police. Mm. Um, how did it come to be that he was arrested in the first place, and then also how did it come to be that you were arrested with this particular Well, you know, it was, we were discussed the thing obviously. And I organized a, a big purple wig for him to wear, should he do it. Uh, and so that they, the people would look at the wig, they wouldn't see his face, and they wouldn't be able to identify him. He was also supposed to change the car registration, uh, and, and you know, that sort of thing. Otherwise, the arrangements were his. The only instruction that I really gave him was that no, in, no, no one else but Arnie should be uh, harmed in this case. If he had bodyguards, it's off. You don't uh, do it on that day. And he just happened to be patrolling uh, the Dawn Park area where Harney resided and saw that Harney didn't have bodyguards. And he thought, well, this is the golden opportunity. But I expressly said to him, not on the Easter weekend, because the Easter weekend was a time when it's holidays, people would be at home. So, so he was then arrested uh, two days after the... No, he was arrested the same day. The same day. They, in you fact, instead of going onto the highway where he would have been lost, he drove down the, the, the main street of Boxburg for some strange reason. And uh, a couple of policemen were, were driving along. They pulled up next to him, looked, and he met the description that uh, this person had given, you know, in the call, and they arrested him. But of course, I wasn't arrested. The reason why I was arrested because after a week's of interrogation, the security branch people filled him up with beer and managed to convince him that they were on our side politically and that they wanted to warn me so he must tell them quickly who, I, who else was involved so that he could warn us so that we could get out of the country. And that's how I then became connected. And there was uh, also a, a domestic worker, I think, that testified against you about uh, the firearm, if I recall. Is that correct? 
Yes. Now, that was another strange uh, situation. In the uh, trial, the question of the handing over of the weapon was essential to the circumstantial evidence case which the state was building because they knew we weren't going to testify because they'd been taping our legal visits and all sorts of getting up to all sorts of skullduggery. So they knew we weren't going to testify. So what they did was they created a feasible circumstantial case to, to sink me. And of course, that was one of the links where she supposedly saw me hand over the weapon to, uh, to Janus. But it was impossible for her to have seen that because if you have a look at the house, and I actually sent a note to my advocate, Henny de Foss, who's now a judge, and I said to him, look, ask for an in loco uh, inspection, because it will be clear from that that she couldn't have seen anything about handing over, and, and that would break down their circumstantial evidence. But of course, he just ignored it. I would especially like to hear your view on, on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and your application for amnesty. Um, firstly, would you believe that, that the, your process, looking back at the TRC, do you believe it was free and fair and, and um, that, you were, that there was a balanced trial or a balanced uh, hearing? Well, first of all, one of the stipulations for the amnesty committee was that it had to be representative of the demographic situation in South Africa. In other words, there had to be an Afrikaner on as well. Advocate Chris uh, de Jager, who was a colleague of mine in, par in Parliament, was a member of the committee. He was bundled off by George Bezos, the advocate who represented uh, the Hani family, and on the uh, pretext that because at one stage on instructions from the CP, he lodged the case against Chris Hani, And Bezos said, no, he would be biased, so he must withdraw. They replaced him then with uh, advocate Denzel Potkiller, a member of the Khalid community. So the committee was no longer representative of the South African demographic. And, you know, it was quite obvious afterwards when I saw the judgment that the, the whole process was a show. It was a showcase to show the people how the ANC government deals with opposition. We were traipsed all over the country. We were in, Bo in Benoni, we were in Pretoria, we were out at uh, Mamalodi, we were taken to Johannesburg. It was a circus, and it was obvious just, just to showcase. Well, it, it's quite well known that the ANC was also involved with, with uh, political crime, so to speak. How, how did the ANC package their, their, um, their case against you given the fact that the ANC was, was doing more or less the same? Well, they, they didn't really package their case. I mean, my, my uh, thing was done by Bezos uh, on behalf of the Arnie uh, family, and then uh, Advocate Mchair, who was the, uh, the Amnesty Committee advocate. And they brought all sorts of witnesses and what have you to testify. Uh, it, was all, it was like a trial, but it wasn't supposed to be a trial. You know, like they said, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't to victimize the Afrikaner. In the meantime, it was totally a Nuremberg form of victimization of Afrikaners. And if you look at the process and the people on their side who got amnesty and the difficulties the Afrikaner uh, applicants uh, experienced, it became clear. Uh, there was one example that I like quoting. There was a fellow by the name of Palmer. P-H-A-M-A, -A, who was in prison with me. Uh, he had uh, shot dead 15 uh, IFP supporters who were traveling in a combi you know, on the uh, East Rand to attend a reconciliation meeting with the ANC. So, I mean, they were aimed at peace and here he wiped a lot of them out. But in the process, he also shot a traffic officer and killed him. When his application came before the Amnesty Committee, they granted him amnesty for the 15 uh, IFP people that he killed, and they also granted him amnesty for the killing of the traffic officer, even though he didn't apply for amnesty for that murder. 
I mean, we had another case where a guy walk in KwaZulu Natal walking past the house and he sees lights on uh, and he's, he's drunk. He goes in there and he shoots the people, uh, kills them. That's a political deed. Young people go berserk in the Cape and they stone an uh, American University student, Amy Beale, stone her to death, w belonging to no political organization except a concocted one, and they get amnesty. Yes. Um, and there's also the example of the St. James... That was, that was a disgraceful... St. James Church, there was a, uh, the Heidelberg Tavern in the Cape. Innocent people were shot. I mean, how can you go into a church on a Sunday where people are praying and worshipping Almighty God and shoot uh, at random and kill people? I mean, it's, and then still have that classified as a political murder. So, so explain that to me, because that was one of the, the uh, I, I don't think it was the only finding, but I think one of the findings in your case was that this particular murder was not politically motivated. Mm. Um, but, but how was that argued, uh, given that Chris Harney was the leader of the Communist Party, he was also commander of Mkantuisi's way, the military wing of the ANC. Um, so how was that framed as not politically motivated, as opposed to, for example, the St. James uh, massacre? They actually drafted the legislation for the Truth Commission with the amnesty in such a way that there were all sorts of clauses which you had to meet. You know, when the interim constitution was agreed, there was a clause which stated that all political offences shall receive amnesty. And all that Parliament had to do was to create the vehicle for granting of amnesty. But with people like Nsebeza and Bezos and these people using their crafts to close the routes for various people, they included a clause that you had to be instructed by your political party. Now, I wasn't instructed by my political party, but I was, and I went to great lengths to explain that, I was in such a position in the, my party where I was the equivalent of a cabinet minister. Now, in government, cabinet ministers make decisions and if they make the wrong decision, their party acts against them. I made the decision that in the interests of our freedom and the interests of good order in South Africa, that Hani's death became necessary. But they ignored that and they used the clause that my party had not authorized it to uh, prevent me from getting amnesty. Yeah. Because that's the, the other question I wanted to ask you was there was there seemed to be some tension between you and the leadership of, of the Conservative Party uh, during the, the Truth and Reconciliation hearings uh, because you uh, argued that you were acting uh, on a political motive and the Conservative Party tried to uh, repudiate that. So was, is that an accurate uh, description? Uh, well, they didn't try to repudiate it. They actually just put it in such a way that they said, I may have thought that what I was doing was to the benefit of the party, but they didn't have a policy of violence. Well, the ANC also didn't have a policy of violence, but they perpetrated lots of violence. And it was accepted as their policy because it became the practice eventually. And there was a lot of violence from the conservative side leading up to the, uh, to the handover. Places, you know, bombs were exploded. I know a colleague of mine, Chris Boerter, uh, was instrumental in blowing up the Hillview High School and also the Krugersdorp Post Office. He got amnesty, in spite of the fact that the Conservative Party didn't order him to blow those places up. Uh, but they agreed he had a political motive. And that was the whole basis of my application. It was a political motive. There was nothing personal about the whole story. And although Bezos tried with all sorts of things, examining my financial records to see whether I'd been paid for doing it, they could come up with nothing. And they couldn't even come up with a broader conspiracy, although they, the SACP used this for years to keep me in prison. There were two assassination attempts on your life. Do you believe that it was politically motivated? Uh, there's no doubt in my mind, because at the moment you're, you're uh, drowning on your own blood. 
But they said it's been abolished. I said, not for me. I'm still on death row.